Hey, welcome to English One. My name is Warren Parkin. I want you to call me Warren. Um, I think that we're going to have a good semester here. You're going to learn how to read better and write better. Now, it's important that you understand that writing and reading are new technologies in the history of humanity. Humans have been around on this earth for more than 200,000 years, and writing was only invented about 6,000 years ago. So, if you are, are a person who has been told that you're not good at English, well, people aren't born good at reading and writing. It used to be a specialty. Now, it is uh, summertime in Florida. I'm outside on my porch that I built with my son that comes off of my kitchen and I am hotter than hell. I don't know about how you are, but I hope you're having a good day and that you are staying safe. My preference would be to teach you in person, but right now, uh, Florida is continuing to set new records every day for cases of COVID-19. So, my biggest concern besides the loss of life, and I grieve about it every day throughout the world that people are dying from it, is that a generation of people will have their education interrupted. So, I'm a holdout. You can see me. I'm old. I was offered to teach online full time about 15, no, about 12 years ago. And I told them no. But I'm making the exception because these are exceptional circumstances. So, welcome to English One. I will help you if you are, are a writer that you feel like you're at this level, I'll help you get up to this level. If you're a writer that's at this level, I'll help you get up to the higher level. I will help you. And I'm happy uh, to have questions, and you can contact me any, any time. I will be posting my phone number on uh, uh, the college website and on Canvas. And you can contact me any time from the hours of 7 in the morning until 11 or 12 at night and I'm happy to answer questions. My experience is that stress never helped anybody learn and worry never helped anybody learn. So please don't worry, just contact me and I will, I will be of help. Now I'm 55 years old. I want to tell you a little bit about myself, not because I want to brag about myself, but I want you to trust me. And I know that I have uh, what I like to call homeless chic <clears throat> as, <clears throat> as my uh, persona. I actually have people sometimes walk up to me and ask me if I want day labor work. And not lately because I haven't been sitting at the picnic table at the gas station reading the newspaper. But um, because of the virus, because I've been sheltering in place with my family. Oh, I should show you my family a little bit. That's my family right there. Uh, my now my now ex-wife is is over there on the end, and um, but I have. Oh, let's see, there now you can see my whole family. They're all grown up now. I've helped raise six children, <clears throat> and uh, my youngest is 21 years old. Now, my experience with English <clears throat> is that when I was 21, sorry, when I was uh, yeah, 20, 21 years old, I changed my major to English. Before that, it had been in the sciences, and I took a semester of science at Brigham Young University, and I had a full-ride scholarship there. But I soon realized that I didn't want to be at what Mormons call God's University. After that semester, and it was a four-year full, full scholarship, I could actually fail 15 hours. Can you imagine having a scholarship that will still pay out the money for your tuition and with the option of failing an entire semester? <laughs> After that semester, I went on a Mormon mission. And I'm no longer a Mormon. I left that when I was 27 years old. But I fulfilled that mission. I had paid, I'd saved money for that 
since the time I was 12 years old. So I paid for that entire year and a half. Now, when I got back, I thought, oh, I will major in business. And so I took business classes at the University of Utah. And, and like I say, I never looked back at, at BYU. So I had to pay for all of my education out of pocket at that time. And um, when I got back, my cousin was going to school and I went to visit him. And this was back in July of 35 years ago. Yeah, 35 years ago. And he had to go to class and I said, do you have anything to read? And he said, have you ever read Hemingway? And I said, no. And he threw a novel off of his bookshelf at me. And maybe not at me. And it was Hemingway's A Farewell to Arms. And I read that book over the next day and a half and fell in love with Hemingway. And I didn't think anything of that love. I just kept reading all of his novels that fall while I was in school taking business classes. And I found out that the English department was offering a seminar in Ernest Hemingway that was for seniors and graduate students. And I signed up for it along with business classes. And about halfway through spring quarter, and actually they called it winter quarter, so about halfway through there, maybe in February or, yeah, about in February, the end of February, I realized, oh my God, they'll give you a degree in, for reading beautiful literature. And so I ended up following among English uh, majors. And all of the novels that we discussed in that class, I had read before. The only thing that was new in that class for me were the short stories by Ernest Hemingway. I didn't even know he had written short stories. And that it was part of how he got his fame. He's a great, 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 great writer. So I changed my major to English and uh, completed it. I did it backwards. I took upper level courses and then toward, at the very end I took the class I was supposed to take. The reason I could get away with that is because things weren't computerized and so they couldn't tell that I didn't have the prereqs uh, to do it. But I could obviously do the work. And the quarter I was graduating when I was uh, 22 years old, I took one more course uh, for my minor in Spanish. And I had learned Spanish and I studied Spanish while I lived in South America in Paraguay. And the first class I took when I got back for that minor was a class that gave me two and a half years worth of credit because I understood the language. It was a class for people who had learned to be fluent in Spanish and uh, needed to just uh, uh, brush up on their writing skills. And that quarter I was graduating with my uh, major in English literature. I needed one more class to have my minor and a Mexican novels class was offered. And it was taught by Joel Hancock who became a mentor of mine. He was a great, great, great professor. And I just was blown away by how beautiful, because uh, I'd never read a novel in Spanish. I'd read the Bible in Spanish from cover to cover. I had read a biography of Gandhi uh, while I was living in Paraguay uh, in Spanish, but never any literature. And I fell in love with Spanish literature. And so I graduated in May that year. And then uh, in June, I went back. And a year later, I had my bachelor degree in Spanish literature. I then told my wife, because by then I was married, I was 23 years old and we were expecting a baby. And I said, I still want to go to school but I don't want to pay for it anymore because I had turned down a scholarship from University of Utah to accept my scholarship to BYU. But I was tired of paying out of pocket. And um, I told her, if they will pay me to go to school, what do you think? And she was already established in her career. She had done three bachelor degrees. Sherry is her name. She's dead now of cancer. Uh, she died about 20 years ago. And... Um, uh, she told me she had gotten her bachelor degrees in psychology, child development, and special education with an emphasis in severe, which back then was a whole other year of 
going to college and expertise and she worked with people with autism and behavioral difficulties and she told me that sounds good if they'll pay you and so I applied and that's how I paid for graduate school is that they waived my tuition and I started teaching college when I was 23 which I think is about uh, 32 years ago so that's the long and the short of it while I was uh, doing my uh, degrees in Spanish literature my master and my doctoral degrees I took a lot of comparative lit and that is why I am qualified to teach you now in English 1 we're going to learn you're going to learn a lot about interpreting texts and a lot about how to write better and like I say you're not going to make a mistake that I haven't seen before and if if you do that will make me happy <laughs> but I will I will help you learn so if you follow what I tell you to to do you will become a much better writer and also a much better communicator and a much better reader now we're using for this course this book Stra uh, strategies for successful writing a rhetoric research guide reader and handbook it has to be very wordy because it's very academic no um, but it has some really really good articles in it and we're gonna start off with um, narrative essays and these are essays that will help you uh, get ready for your first essay that you will write for me and I will give you more details on canvas about the assignments what you will read and uh, your first your first essay in addition to using this book I am going to talk to you about fairy tales and mythology and I want you to write this down and I want you to memorize this definition of mythology so myths are stories that teach us about ourselves others and the world around us so myths are stories that teach us about ourselves others and the world around us myths answer the whys and hows myths answer the whys and hows if any of you are parents or you're an older sibling or you've taken care of little children you know that little kids walk around saying why 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 when when some children are two years old that's all they can say is why why is the sky blue why 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 so I want to share with you a couple of Greek myths uh, during this introduction we will also talk about Christian myths now it's very important though before I do that that you understand that the common understanding of the word myth is that that means a lie I am not talking to you about lies I'm not talking to you about truths I'm talking to you about the human desire to understand how the world came into existence why people act the way they act and what it is that people desire most so when I say Christian mythology please do not get offended and think I'm saying Christian lies the same because I am not I'm talking about the wisdom from Christianity or when I say Judaic mythology I am not saying Judaic lies such as the Genesis the book of Genesis I'm talking about for example with the garden story in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 and uh, it that 
these are stories that explain things. So, and I'm not asking you to have faith either. So when, and also when I say Greek mythology, I'm not talking about Greek lies. But right now I'd like to share with you a couple of Greek myths. The first myth I would like to share with you is the myth of Arachne from Greek mythology. So this is Greek mythology, right? Now, Arachne was a very, very, very beautiful and talented young woman. And her talent had to do with weaving. And she could weave such beautiful tapestries that it made it look like you were seeing it in person. She would make them of nature, of the world, of people. It was the type of tapestry that was the precursor of photography. And her reputation grew and grew and grew and people wanted to buy this beauty that she was creating. And as her reputation grew, people started saying, Arachne actually is better than the goddess who gave us weaving. And the goddess, you know, you can't diss a goddess by comparing a human to a goddess. And she got wind of this and was very, very upset. And so she came down from Mount Olympus, which is where the Greek gods uh, have their home, and she challenged Arachne to a weave-off. And people, word got spread, and people came from all over to witness Arachne and the goddess competing against each other to see who could make the most beautiful weaving tapestries. And they showed up early in the morning and the goddess sat down at her loom, and Arachne sat down at her loom. And they started to weave, and people were awe-inspired, and they couldn't get over it. It was so incredible. But by the end of that day when the sun set, it was obvious that Arachne had outweaved the goddess. And because of that, the goddess said, Fine, if you like weaving so much, you can do it the rest of forever. And she changed her into a spider. And that brings up a part of Western culture that uh, is very important to understand. And this idea is that if you exceed this is an idea from the Greeks, okay? Because Western culture comes from different fountains. But this idea is hubris. This concept is called hubris, and that has to do with exceeding one's bounds or one's limits, and it also is a synonym for excessive pride. And so, since Arachne bested the goddess, she was turned into an ugly spider that would continue to weave and weave and weave. Now, for me, I like spiders, just to be frank about it. Um, I like to watch them work. I like to, sometimes with banana spiders, I'll pull down their web just so I can see them repair it. But they do it again and again and again. And they make these beautiful patterns. But she was punished. She was changed from human into a spider. And the scientific term for spiders in English is arachnids. So that's, that's the myth of... of Arachne. It a answers the questions, where do spiders come from? Why is it that they do what they do? Why do they keep doing it? And how did it happen in the first place? All right, so please uh, take this note.
Western Western culture is uh, comes from three major major rivers, three major rivers, and and this is well four sorry the Greco-Roman tradition. and the Judeo-Christian traditions. And these are major fountains. Now, I'm not saying that other cultures haven't influenced Western culture. And by Western culture, I'm talking about the culture that's all over the quote-unquote New World, as well as in Europe. Okay, Obviously, African uh, culture and African Americans, people who were enslaved and forced to immigrate here, have had a huge impact on what is known as Western culture. Africans uh, have had a huge impact on music. It's where rock and roll came from. It's where the blues came from. It's where um, uh, much of, of what happens in dance has come from. And um, so there are other factors, but these are the major rivers of what we call our American culture, of what we call Western culture writ large. All right, so the next myth I would like to talk to you about. So remember this term, hubris, exceeding one's limits, excessive pride. And remember that in Greek mythology, as well as in Judeo-Christian mythology, if you piss the gods off, they will fuck your day. I'd like to talk to you next about the god Kronos. And Kronos was the supreme power in the world in Greek mythology. But there was a prophecy that he had received from Delphi, from a seer, that said, you're going to have a child, and it's going to grow up, and it will overthrow you. Now, gods did not want to be overthrown. So his wife had a baby, and she brought this little bundle of joy to him to look at, and he took one look at it and, and ate the baby. So he is what we would call a child gobbler. Now, this happened many more times. She got pregnant. She carried the child who was going to be a god uh, to fruition birthed the baby and brought it to him and each time he looked at that little baby and went <coughs> now finally she got sick of that and so the last time she had a baby she decided that she wanted to raise that baby herself and instead of taking the baby to her husband who had already eaten at least five or six of her children she wrapped a piece of uh, a, a stone in the blankets and she brought him this stone. And by this time, he was so accustomed to eating his children that he just didn't even bother to look at it. So he didn't know what he was eating. And he threw that blanket and, and the stone that she had put in there into his mouth and swallowed it down. <clears throat> now, in secret, she raised her son, Zeus. And when Zeus grew to adulthood, he stole his father's sword and he confronted his father and he took that sword and pushed it into his stomach and slit him all the way open. So what we're talking about there is the first Caesarean section in a way. 
and all of Zeus's siblings that had been eaten for all those years, they sprung out and they were full adults too. And they became the gods of, of Mount Olympus and of the world. Now, this concept of the child gobbler is a concept that I want you to keep in mind as we explore fairy tales and myths. It's also a concept that uh, actually psychologically shows a competition between parents and children. All right. Now, there's also another concept illustrated in the story. So it's not just that Zeus split his father all the way up his belly. It's that afterwards, once all those siblings who had been stuck in his digestive system came out, they were mad as hell. And so, they, and they didn't want their father to ever do that again. And what they did is they castrated him. They cut off his genitals. They cut off his phallus. Phallus is a fancy word for penis. And they threw his unit into the ocean. And then they took their father and they threw him into the sky where he could never come back to earth. He'd always just have to watch throughout time. And so from Kronos' name, we get the word chronology. And chronology has to do with as time occurs. Kronos is the literal embodiment of father time now there are other words that come from his name like chronicle and if you go back to the judeo-christian uh, tradition you have the book of chronicles it's what happened a chronometer a chronometer is a watch now i don't have a watch anymore I threw mine away in the jungle in Paraguay back when I was 19 years old. But I do have my watch on my cell phone, which you are welcome to call me on. The other concept that I want to talk to you about in relation to this myth, because it's a more complicated myth than the Arachne myth. And and it answers the questions so far that we've talked about. Where did the gods come from? How did things happen? Okay. This other concept is this is a concept that I've come up with. I haven't read any other scholars who talk about it, but it has to do with male birth fantasy. You know, what is the one thing that men cannot do that women can? And that is creating human life, right? And so throughout Western culture, we have stories where, miraculously enough, men are giving birth. And in this case, Kronos gave birth to all these children after he had ate them. In addition to that, we have the second ripple of male birth fantasy because when his children threw his uh, unit into the ocean, he was so potent that he conceived another child who came out of the ocean as a full-grown adult. And her name is... the goddess Aphrodite. Aphrodite is the goddess of love. Her Roman name, because the Romans, when they invaded Greece and took it over, and found the Greek culture so fascinating that they not only adopted Greek language, uh, as well as their, they continued their own, okay, Latin, but they actually adopted all of their gods. They just renamed them into Latin. And her name in Latin is, is Venus. And from her name comes many terms such as Mons Veneris, 
the mountain of love, and that's used to describe female genitalia, or venereal disease. Notice the van part, venereal disease, VD, what people call it now, there's what there's a fancy name for it, sexually transmitted disease, STD. Um, I think that venereal is a much more, um, how shall I say, rich term. They both mean, the, these terms mean the same thing. But so, this myth of Kronos tells us where did time come from? Where did the gods come from? Where did love come from? Because Aphrodite actually ended up spreading love throughout the world, even in the face of the circumstance of um, a horrible uh, mutilation of the father. It also shows that there is rivalry between children and their parents. It also shows that gods do not want to be overthrown. All right, so I think that's enough story uh, for this introduction. Uh, maybe next time I can do a, talk to you about a fairy tale. We'll find out. It just depends on uh, what I'm, I'm filling up to. But I want you to make sure that you keep notes on the different myths that I talked to you about. Also, uh, I want you to, to keep track of the different fairy tales I will talk about. I want you to take notes on the different readings that I assign. And welcome to English One. I'm looking forward to getting to know you. Oh, I should say this. I teach because I hate poverty. And the fastest way out of poverty I know is to get a college education. All right. And I also teach because I love it. I love to see people grow and develop their talents and their creativity. And you will find that out from me. And if you take the feedback I give you about your writing and you apply what I have explained to you to change, you will grow. And I can promise you that. And you will look back on the semester as a fundamental experience in your college education. And not only that, because education is one thing, right? But it will help you see the world differently. And I will help you learn how to read the world in a variety of ways. Not with an agenda of convincing you of anything. Just with the agenda of helping you develop your analytical skills. Because you will need those, not just in the rest of your college courses, but for the rest of your life. You have a good day. Thank you.